Ocala's Information Station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala! All right, 23 minutes before 11 o'clock. We need to change the, the track here, change the channel, change the topic, of course. We're going from music to law. Uh, John Fuller is here. He's an attorney at the law firm of Fuller & Fuller. The show is called Legally Yours, and uh, he's on the air to answer your questions about your particular legal issue, or maybe the, the issue of a friend, and not uh, in national politics. So just kind of stay away from that, if you would. Uh, the phone number to call in is... The WOCA Climate Control Source Hotline, 622-9622. John Fuller, good morning, John. Good morning, Larry. Good morning to all of our uh, friends who are listening in. Yes. And uh, we hope that uh, if you have a question or have a legal issue that you are concerned about, that we can discuss generally, uh, we'd love for you to... Uh, Just pull that microphone near, near we'd, you. We'd love there for you, you to uh, call in. <laughs> How am I doing, Very, Professor? <laughs> uh, you know, I've only been doing this about a year and a much half. Better, much better, much better. Anyway, the, uh, the, the purpose is to try to talk about issues in general terms. The law is something that is fact-driven and detail-driven. So, as you said in our opening, if someone has a, think they have a legal case, uh, primarily in the areas of personal injury, uh, automobile accidents, um, uh, business litigation, social security disability, or complex family law matters involving substantial issues and assets, those are the things that our law firm, Fuller & Fuller, focus on. Uh, and we would be happy to, uh, to to talk with anybody who wanted to uh, uh, discuss a possible case from the standpoint of actual representation. But this yeah, show is yes. fun because we get to talk about so many different things. Yeah, we, have, right. yes. we have we have we have. I'm always uh, thrilled by the callers we get. How well educated they are. How. Uh, astute they are, and uh, the better you understand our legal system, uh, hopefully it, the system will, will work a little better. Uh, the one thing I want to say before we take the first call is when, when you hear people criticize the system, and, and I certainly have criticized the system because it is far from perfect. I believe, I truly believe it's better than any other system of, of justice that we have. But it's only as good as the people that are in it. And the judiciary was designed by our founding fathers to be an independent third branch that is to be as free from politicalization as possible. And I was very troubled to learn that, 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 that the Republican Party, I'll go ahead and say it, came out uh, with an attack on three Florida Supreme Court justices and are mounting a huge publicity campaign because the opinions that have been authored or which they are one of nine justices that have joined in the majority opinion uh, is contrary to their political point of view. The most important thing, the most important check and balance we have in this country is an independent judiciary. And my goodness, I don't like all their opinions. I don't like their rulings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but if they're competent people who are ethical, honorable people doing a good job, and all three of the Supreme Court justices who are up for election uh, got over 90% approval rating uh, with the lawyers in the state of Florida who appear before them. So... Uh, you know, if we if we lose the independence of the judiciary, then the whole concept of our uh, separation of powers that our country was based upon right, with right. the executive, judicial, and legislature all starts to unravel. And so hopefully people will look at the ability and the uh, uh, track record of people who are in the judiciary, uh, and it's a merit retention system. Uh, way, the way it works at the appellate court level, they are appointed by the governor after being screened by a judicial nominating committee made up of lay people and lawyers, and the judge and the governor appoints them. <clears throat> then they have to 
they, they have to stand for re-election. That they won't have to have someone run against them at the appellate level, uh-huh. but it's called merit retention. And every six years, their their name is put on the ballot, and people vote as to whether or not they should be retained on their merit. Now, our circuit judges and our county judges are elected positions. They're supposed to be nonpartisan, where you don't inject uh, partisan politics. You don't run as a Republican or a Democrat right. when you run for judicial race. You're supposed to run on a neutral ticket. Uh, I think there's been some evidence uh, of late where some candidates have tried to uh, to, to inject uh, uh, political philosophies in the hopes of garnering more votes. I think that's a dangerous trend. Yeah, so, I agree. I think so right. I, uh, you know, I'm, I don't mean to be on my soapbox this morning, but uh, you know, let's face it: if you're a litigant, if you're hurt and you want to sue somebody. Or if a relative of yours is wrongfully accused of a criminal act, you want the best judge that you can possibly have to be the person who is administering the trial process, which is a search for the truth. Yeah. And and if you have somebody who's capable, the system works a lot better than if you have somebody who is in that judicial position because they may have been someone's political <laughs> lackey. Uh, and, and before the Judicial Nominating Committee, judges were just appointed on a political patronage system. So if you were best friends with the governor's brother-in-law and you had a law degree, even if you weren't smart enough to walk and chew chewing gum, you might be appointed <laughs> judge. Yeah. And, and, and uh, when Bob Graham was governor, he said, we've got to take the politics out of this more. The governor still appoints, but there needs to be a screening process so that the most qualified candidates are sent to the governor so that the, the appointment process has some check and balance in it. So Makes sense to me. In any event, uh, enough on that topic. Uh, what you've been doing interesting. Well, you want to go to the phone? You have some. Yes, to... yes, I'm sorry. I apologize for keeping them waiting. That's okay. Good, good morning. You're on the air with John Fuller. Good morning, Larry. This is you. Wow, what a great dissertation that was. I forgot well, my question now. Well, I, I apologize for getting a little long-winded. That's, a, that's an occupational hazard that I've been accused of having before. But thank you so much for calling. How are you today? I'm, I'm fine. I just have a question for you, but after listening to what you said, this may not be a question that, that I should ask you. That's okay. Um, do Go you ahead. feel that every person should have a, uh, irre, uh, a revocable living trust, or do you think that that's only for people that have assets over a certain amount of money. And I will hang up and listen if you can answer that. And I thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. I, let, let, me, uh, let me comment on that. Let me first uh, give a caveat and a disclaimer, as I have often done on this show. I am not a wills, estate, and trust lawyer. That's a specialized area, and it is not an area that I practice in. Obviously, having practiced law 39 years, there was a period of time when I started practicing when lawyers in this area did everything, just like your old family doctor used to do 30, 40, 50 years ago. But law has become so complex that that people started specializing and the client started getting better care because the lawyer who handled their case was specialized in that area. Let me say this to, to the young lady who called in. What, what I recommend whenever I'm asked that question is... Uh, what you need to do is to consult with an estate planning attorney. Not everybody needs a will, contrary to popular belief. It depends upon what their assets are and who their beneficiaries are, or their heirs at law. Uh, but everybody needs to do some estate planning. It can be as simple as a 30-minute conference where you say, um, here's what I have, and if I die, I want everything to go to my wife and then to my children. Well, that's basically what the Florida law of intestate distribution says. Intestate means you die without a will. So if that's what you want and you've put everything in joint names so it's going to pass to the to the person you want it to go to, you may not need a will. So I don't know whether you need a revocable or irrevocable trust, a pour-over trust, 
there are many, many different things to take into consideration. Certainly, the, the larger the assets, the more complex the holdings of the assets, the more complex the distribution scheme is, the more sophisticated the document needs to be, because by the time that document co- sees the light of day and becomes operative, the person who's made it is dead, and you can't ask them. Well, what did you really? Yeah, right. What did you really want? What did you really mean? And so it's a document that needs to be carefully crafted by a specialist who specializes in wills, estates, and trusts. And I think that everyone ought to have the issue addressed by a lawyer who practices in that area to determine what they need. I will finish with one other recommendation to our listeners and to the young lady who called in specifically. You ought not to just consult with the lawyer one time because life is like a stream. It flows and it ebbs and flows and things happen and things change. Loved ones die. People get divorced. Uh, Children are born. Uh, people get remarried and their stepchildren involved. Anytime there is a significant event that changes your life, you need to go down and have your estate plan reviewed and updated. Mm. Because what was a good estate plan for you 25 years ago, when you were 25 years old and didn't own anything, and yeah, right. you weren't married, and, and, and you didn't have uh, anything of substance, and you didn't have any children, and you didn't have a spouse, uh, it, it, it's a lot different than when you're 45, 50, or whatever, and you're married, and you have a bunch of children, uh, stepchildren, some of them older, some of them younger. Uh, a lot of things in life change. Uh, in fact, the only thing constant about life is change. And uh, so I tell folks, look, if something significant has happened in your life, uh, go have your estate plan reviewed. You may not need to change a thing. You may not want to change anything, but then you need to do it. And and I realize this is not your area, but in a living will, does does that take into consideration the the point of life? Let's say where you're no longer able to. Let's say you've got Alzheimer's disease, you're still alive, so the will doesn't take place yet. But th- is that where the living will? Well, living will, as I understand it, and you're right, this is not my area of expertise. But a living will is is a is a end of life directive is what it's really called, and and it provides instruction to your family and caregivers on how you want to be cared for in the event you lose the capacity to make that decision at the end of your life. Oh, and, that, and that's it. It has nothing to do with distribution of no. your, your possessions or anything. Okay, let's go back to the phone. John Fuller is your host. If you have a question for John, the number is 622-WOCA. That's the WOCA Climate Control Source hotline, 622 622- Nine six two two. Good morning. You're on the air with John Fuller. Yes. Good morning, Mr. Fuller. Good morning, sir. How are you today? Very good. Thanks. Uh, earlier today on, on the uh, on this radio station, they were talking about concealed weapons. Very interesting subject. What, what are my my rights as a civilian uh, with the with the concealed weapon situation? As far as uh, where I can carry it, where I can take it, and how can I use it? Okay. That's a great question, and one I have litigated in the past. Right. Uh, and and uh, Florida was the first state in the United States to pass a law that its citizens of the state of Florida uh, are entitled to a concealed carry permit, and the state of Florida shall issue it and cannot discretionarily or arbitrarily refuse to do it as long as you meet the criteria, which is that you have had an appropriate class taught by a certified firearms instructor and that you have demonstrated competency with a firearm in that class. You are subjected to a background search. You file a fingerprint card and a passport photo and you pay an application fee, and the state of Florida shall issue you a permit. Almost all other states now have followed Florida's lead because when Florida passed that law, the incident of violent crimes went down dramatically. Right. Uh, the, the, before that law was passed, there were a bunch of, of uh, 
what they call bump and rob cases where people would see rental cars on the interstate, especially in South Florida, and yeah. they would crash into it, and when the family got out, they would beat them up and rob them and so forth and so on. When they passed the law that uh, qualified citizens could carry a concealed weapon, they found that uh, those types of crimes went down dramatically. Uh, the other part of your question is a little more complicated to answer, and that is, what is your right to have, possess, and carry a weapon if you do not qualify? Well, if you're a convicted felon, you're not entitled to own or possess firearms, okay. period. Okay. Uh, if you are a citizen who has no conviction, you've never had a domestic violence injunction against you, You've never renounced your citizenship. You're not an illegal alien. Uh, but you haven't gotten the concealed weapons permit. Yeah. You have a right to have a firearm. You have a right to have it in your home. You have a right to carry it in your automobile. However, it cannot be concealed upon your person. And if you are carrying it in your automobile, it cannot be readily accessible. Now, a lot of people, and I've had a lot of law enforcement officers explain that standard in this fashion, which I don't believe is entirely correct, but it is a generally held fiction that if the, the, the weapon in your vehicle is, is carried in such a fashion that it is a two-step process for you to withdraw it, yeah. that determines that it is not readily acceptable, uh, okay. readily, readily uh, available or accessible. Uh, don't believe that. I, I don't believe that's the law. I researched it very carefully. Okay. That was It used to be, uh, and a lot of people in gun shops, when you go in to buy it, they'll say, look, if you put this, this handgun in a holster that has a snap on it yeah. and you put it in your glove compartment, in order for you to get to it, you've got to open the glove compartment, and you've got to unsnap the holster and take it out. That's a two-step thing. That's not readily accessible. Okay. I was unable to find any case law under the Florida appellate court cases when I actually researched this a number of years ago, and I haven't had occasion to do it recently. But, but they are, the standard is, is it readily accessible? Yeah. And, and if you have it in a holster with a Velcro with just a Velcro snap in the console sitting right next to you, you may be at risk that they would consider that readily accessible. Yeah. Uh, so the safest thing to do is to go apply and get a concealed weapons permit. Okay. That allows you to carry the weapon uh, on your person. It has to be concealed. Florida is not an open carry state. They are okay. some open carry states. Really? Ver Vermont, uh, huh. Nevada, I believe, the, where, where you have a right to just put on a holster and walk down the street and wow. carry the weapon in, wow. in an open fashion. Florida hasn't done that. However, Florida did modify its concealed weapons permit because people who would carry a concealed weapon underneath, say, a, a, a suit jacket or a sport coat or something like that, and they would go into a department store and they would reach up to get an item off of one of the high shelves and their coat would open up yeah. and, and reveal the weapon yeah. and somebody see the weapon and freak out, well, that would be an offense. You could be arrested for, quote, reckless display of a firearm, yeah. even though you had a concealed permit. Wow. Now they've, they've modified that, that if, if it is concealed and it just accidentally is revealed with yeah. no, no overt act on your part of threatening with it or anything like that, it's no longer an offense. Yeah. Other things in the law is that, that we now have many, many states that give reciprocity. So if you have a permit in the state of Florida, okay. there, most states will, will honor the Florida permit okay. if Florida honors their permit. Oh. The worst states, the absolute worst states for citizens to exercise their Second Amendment right to bear arms and to have a concealed weapon where you practically can't do it at all, is Massachusetts, New York, Chicago, Illinois, yeah. uh, California, and Hawaii. Yeah. Those yeah. states have, in my view, extremely draconian laws. Uh, they, 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 
you have permissive, some of the states like California have permissive laws that if a public official thinks you need to carry a gun, yeah. he can issue you a permit. Yeah. Uh, most of the people in California that have the permits are politicians and <laughs> movie stars. Yeah, uh, in, uh, in Hawaii, uh, there's only, I think, two permits that have been issued uh, outside of law enforcement, and they were to relatives of the governor. Uh, yeah. You know, so Florida, Florida was on the was on the cutting edge of that, and most all the other states' laws have have followed the Florida law. And I don't know the exact percentage, but it is less than one percent of yeah. all the licensed permit holders who have ever been charged with any kind of criminal offense. Yeah. Uh, so they're screening the people. Is it perfect? No. No. Uh, but it, 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 in my judgment, is a, is a real fallacy to think that if you had a law that said the citizenry could not have uh, firearms, that, uh, that it would be a safer place because we know that the criminal element are going to get firearms and if you are saying you're going to depend solely upon law enforcement while they do a marvelous job, uh, it would seem to me that you would be safer with the ability to deploy your own firearm and protect yourself in a matter of a few minutes than to wait 20 or 30 minutes for a 911 call. Yeah. Having said that, I want to emphasize, if you're going to own and carry a concealed weapon, you need more training than the basic certification course. You need to go take an NRA certified course. You need to go take some defensive shooting courses. A gun is an inanimate object. Guns don't kill people. People kill people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I once heard someone say in a debate that if we didn't have guns, we wouldn't have so much crime. And the person responding to that, and, and I'm, I don't remember who it was, so I have to, I'm giving credit to the other person. This yeah. was not my quote. He says, guns don't kill people any more than spoons made Rosie O'Donnell fat. <laughs> yeah, uh, because yeah. she's a big anti-gun activist. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, it's you're going to hear it bandied about yeah. politically. I worry the Supreme Court upheld the Second Amendment by a five to four opinion because there were a lot of people arguing that the intent of the founding fathers when they passed the Second Amendment, which is the one that gives you the constitutional right to keep and bear arms, it has a clause and it said uh, a well a well regulated militia being yeah. in the benefit of the country, the citizenry shall have the right to keep and bear arms. There was a huge argument mounted on that uh, to the Supreme Court that, well, we no longer need or have a well-regulated militia yeah. like they did in 1776. Therefore, yeah. it is not an individual right. The Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, said no. The individual does have the right to keep and bear arms, but the individual locality has the right to set up certain restrictions on that. Yeah. See, real, real quickly, uh, leaving Florida that allows a concealed weapon, I'm traveling to a state that also allows, but I'm going through a state of Illinois that doesn't. How can I transport that weapon without getting in trouble? I would call the chief law enforcement officer of the state you're going through, the attorney general's office okay. usually, and get an opinion. You can get an awful lot of information off of a website okay. called packing.org, P-A-C-K-I. Uh, org. Or, okay. uh, and uh, the best thing to do, because these laws do change from I time know, to time, and just because they give you reciprocity, they could have different restrictions. For instance, um, in Florida, it is okay for you to wear a firearm and go into a restaurant where they sell alcohol as yeah. long as it's a restaurant, but you can't carry a firearm in a bar in Florida. You can't carry it in a sports event. You can't yeah. carry it in the courthouse. You can't carry it on a, on a school campus. Yeah. Uh, you certainly can't take it in the sterile area of an airport. Right. Uh, yeah. and, and, and other states have different laws that, that if, you, yeah. if you are carrying a concealed weapon, yeah. you are not entitled to even have a glass of wine oh my in those states. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. you know, you have to check the, the nuances. I've said over and yeah. over, 
the devil's in the details. Yeah. But Evidently, a, each state has, a, has its they, own rulings. Now. They, they do, yeah. But, yeah. The, but there's really good news is is that, that there are organizations that monitor these things regularly, yeah. and they update them regularly, and you can go online, and, and packing.org is about the best one that I have found. Okay. And then the next thing that is absolutely the gold standard is to call... The the chief law enforcement officer of the state okay. in Florida, that would be the attorney general's office, yeah. and ask them to send you a written opinion okay. or a copy of a written opinion that authorizes you what to do. Okay. In some states, uh, what what is required is that if you have a weapon, that you dismantle the weapon, okay. you pack the ammunition in a sealed container separate and apart, you put the seal, you put the weapon dismantled in a different box, and okay. you put them in separate compartments in your automobile while you drive through the state. All right. But it depends on each state. Good okay. question. Good Thank, question. Thank you very much. Great right. topic. Great important topic. and very timely issue as well. All right. Well, gosh, the time always goes so fast. We need to uh, move forward. And, John, if we have an, a need for an attorney, how would we get a hold of you? Yes. Uh, we're at the law firm of Fuller & Fuller, and our office number is 352 352- Five four seven four two nine two. Our toll free number is eight five 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 three four two five six five. We have offices both in Ocala and the villages. And if you have a case where you've been hurt or you have a business controversy or Social Security, any of those areas that we practice in uh, and would care to call us, we'd be glad to talk with you. All right, excellent. Uh, always good to see you, John. Thank always you. Always so a much. pleasure. Thank you, Larry. Right, hanging there. We'll be up next with uh, Dr. Riyad Fakori. Ocala's Information Station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala! ABC News Now. I'm Karen Chase. As he continues his bus tour through the critical battleground state of Ohio, Mitt Romney told...